Okay. Um, let's get started. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we're very happy to bring you the um, 2024 World Bronchiac Disease Conference Takeaway Webinar. Um, we're excited to have Professor Chalmers, who hosted the World Bronchiac Disease Conference in Dundee, Scotland, uh, here to share the highlights um, about the conference. Uh, this conference is brought to you um, by Running on Air. Um, my name is Mary Kitlowski. I am the president and founder of Running on Air, and we're partnering with NTMIR to bring you this as part of World Bronchiectasis Day. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Running on Air, um, we are a nonprofit based in the United States, and um, you can follow us on social media. Our emphasis is on supplemental oxygen, but we also educate around various lung diseases, uh, bronchiectasis, and PCD in particular. I happen to have both of those. We have a portable oxygen concentrator comparison chart um, for those who might need supplemental oxygen or interested, and this is what it looks like, and you can find that on our website. NTMIR is a nonprofit uh, based in Florida. Uh, they have done tremendous work in raising awareness of NTM um, and uh, helping facilitate trials. Um, they have a conference. It, they're, they're kind of getting back to, because of COVID, um, in-person conferences, just had one uh, out in San Diego in May. Um, wonderful organization, and you can learn more about them um, on their social media and their website. And just want to let you know, um, save the date, August 4th, is World NTM Awareness Day. So this will be the second year for World NTM Awareness. So um, moderating with me today is Amy Liebman. She's the president um, of NTM Info and Research. Um, and as I said, it's a nonprofit advocacy group for patients with non-tuberculosis, mycobacterial infections, and related illnesses. Uh, she's the daughter of a patient with NTM lung disease and bronchiectasis. She has spent the last 13 years championing the voice of the patient. In her role, Amy represents the interests and perspectives of patients, healthcare providers, researchers, industry, and other interested stakeholders, serves as a liaison to legislators, regulators, and independent organizations seeking patient input, and speaks at multi-stakeholder meetings. She has presented original patient preference research, co-authored several papers on NTM lung disease, and collaborated on patient-centered and epidemiologic research. Amy's career includes many years in communications and marketing, including for an NBA team and a major community nonprofit organization that mobilized human and financial resources to strengthen local and international community social safety nets. A native of Montreal, Canada, Amy grew up in Toronto before moving to Miami, Florida, where she earned her Bachelor of Arts and Juris Doctor in the, at the University of Miami. She is a member of the American Thoracic Society, the Infectious Diseases Society of America, the American College of Chest Physicians, the American Society for Microbiology, the European Respiratory Society, and the Drug Information Association. So thank you, Amy, for being here and uh, moderating this with me. Thank you, it's lovely to be here. And want to um, thank INSMED for supporting today's event. Uh, without their support, uh, we would not be able to bring you webinars like this. Um, so very much appreciate their support for today. And um, on to why everybody's here. Uh, we'd like to introduce Professor James Chalmers. 
Professor Chalmers is Asthma and Lung UK Chair of Respiratory Research at the University of Dundee and a consultant respiratory physician at Nine Wells Hospital in Dundee, UK. His main clinical interests are in difficult lung infections and particularly bronchiectasis. He runs a research group focused on developing new treatments for bronchiectasis and related conditions. He chairs the European Bronchiectasis Registry and is current chair of the European Respiratory Society Bronchiectasis Clinical Practice Guideline Panel. He is current chief editor of the European Respiratory Journal. Thank you so much, Professor Chalmers, for, for being here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mary and Amy. And, and let me begin by just saying thank you to you and Amy for all of the work that you do on behalf of our patient community. It's really appreciated. Um, and it's fantastic to have this opportunity to, to give you the highlights from the uh, from the World Bronchiexis Conference. So I'll, I'll start sharing my slides. Uh, I've got a few slides to, to go through with some of the exciting data that was presented at the conference. Um, so let me uh, let me begin by saying it was the most successful conference that we've had so far. Um, I'm I begin by saying I'm going to talk about new therapies because I think uh, when I was talking to Mary about what we thought would be the the key takeaway messages from the conference, um, some of the new trial data and the exciting new therapies that were presented at the conference were were one of the things that we wanted to focus on. So just as a as a reminder, I will discuss medications that are not currently approved or available, um, and uh, these aren't treatment recommendations, and you should discuss anything, uh, any questions that you have with your doctor. So it was the most successful World Bronchiexis Conference ever by, by distance. So over 1,000 participants uh, took part in the conference. More than 600 came to my hometown in Dundee to participate. Um, with just under 400 participating virtually. So we're really um, delighted by, by the numbers because traditionally bronchiexis conferences attract between 250 and 350 people. So that's a sign that uh, more healthcare professionals, more people are, are getting interested in helping patients with bronchiexis, which is um, uh, fantastic news. It was a very special World Bronchiexis Conference because we had a number of uh, late-breaking science sessions that presented new clinical trial data. Um, and uh, the slide that I'm showing here is the results of the ASPEN study, which I will discuss uh, in detail. Um, this was a really exciting moment for people with bronchiectasis, and I'll explain more about that when we get to talking about uh, the results that I presented around uh, a new medication called Brenzacatib. It was a special World Bronchiexis Conference because we had some new initiatives, including uh, a patient uh, village and a patient theater, where we gave uh, summaries or bite-sized um, summaries of the, uh, the conference for patients. Um, and we had a session on Friday and a session on the Saturday uh, where some of the experts took questions from patients and, and provided a discussion on some of the data that was being presented. And that's the, the first time that we've done that. Um, and the other thing that was uh, really exciting is that it isn't just doctors that look after patients with bronchiectasis, but also nurses and physiotherapists and other me members of the multidisciplinary team. And so we had a packed, um, a packed series of sessions with nursing, physiotherapy. Um, there's a practical demonstration with one of our patients being taught physiotherapy um, and uh, also sessions around primary ciliary dyskinesia. NPM and others. Um, and as you can see, all of the sessions were absolutely packed, including uh, some people sitting there on the stairs, as you can see. Um, so it shows the interest in this area um, from uh, the, the, the medical community. Bronchiectasis has really arrived as a topic of high interest uh, for, for um, physicians and for um, also the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and it wasn't always like this. So this is this was one of the slides from the, the conference. Just so you know, everything that I'm going to show you is slides taken from the conference. So um, uh, pretty much every slide that I show you will be a slide from the conference. And this was a slide from the first presentation 
in the conference that kind of takes us through the history of bronchiectasis from its discovery as a clinical condition in 1819 through to the development of CT scans, which is now how we diagnose the condition, the discovery of some of the first genes. Um, Mary mentioned primary ciliary dyskinesia, um, those genes sort of discovered in the last 30 years um, through to where we are in 2024. Uh, and what we've seen over that period of time, if you look at the bottom right, is that if I go back uh, 25 years or 20 years, there were very few clinical trials in bronchiectasis. This wasn't seen as a priority area uh, for doctors or for those who are making new medicines. Uh, and gradually over the last few years, we've seen an increase in the number of trials that goes along with the increasing recognition of this disease uh, promotion of the, of the condition and greater awareness of the condition because of things like patient registries. And that's brought us to where we are today, that in, in 2024 at the World Bronchiexis Conference, there were a large number of new clinical trials that were uh, announcing results. Another way of looking at that, and this is a slide that I've shown a few times before, um, is to look at the Public Library of Medicine, where we publish papers, uh, scientific papers. And you see there's this been this big surge in bronchiexis research, over the, particularly over the last 10 years. Um, and we're particularly proud that the European Bronchiexis Network, which is called EMBARC, which works very closely with patients through the European Lung Foundation, uh, has been a big part of that. And a, a significant number of those uh, publications over the last 10 years in, in the highest impact journals have been from um, this European network um, that collaborates very closely with our, our partners across the world and in industry. But there's never been more research and there's never been more new medications being developed for people with bronchiectasis. And that's great news because we know that the existing treatments are not good enough. Um, and those treatments that are in development cover all of the different aspects of the pathophysiology of the disease. So you will know that patients with bronchiectasis have impairment of clearance of mucus from the airways, and there are new treatments that are in development to help with that. And I'll show you some data that was presented at the conference uh, on, a on a molecule called ARENA-1, which is meant to help with clearance of mucus from the airways. The big area of, uh, of development over the last 10 years has been recognizing that inflammation, the immune system is an important part of bronchiectasis. Um, and targeting that through cathepsin C DPP1 inhibition, which is a way of blocking inflammation, uh, is the major breakthrough that we've seen recently. And I'll talk a lot about that, as you would expect. And we're still developing new antibiotics. And we had new data presented at the conference around inhaled antibiotics. And I've highlighted that in, in black. So those are the three areas that I'm going to focus on, new drugs, to clear mucus, new drugs to tackle inflammation, new drugs to tackle infection. Um, and I'll show you the, the results that were presented at the conference and walk you through what the scientific data really means from a patient perspective. And I'm gonna start with what I think was the biggest news at the, at the conference. And I don't think anyone will, will mind me saying that, uh, was the, uh, the announcement of the and the detailed presentation of the phase three clinical trial data for a daily tablet called Brenzacatib. So bronchiectasis is a, an inflammatory condition. The airways become inflamed. Um, what drives you to produce more mucus and what causes the increased susceptibility to infection is that the lungs are inflamed and the immune system doesn't work correctly. Uh, and uh, there's a particular type of cell uh, that the body makes, a white blood cell called a neutrophil, which contributes to that to the greatest extent. And it does that by making these damaging proteins. Um, and you can see it, the names of those here are neutrophil serum proteases, which is a long word. Uh, and the, the most abundant of those is one called neutrophil elastase. Uh, and the new medications, the new anti-inflammatory medications that are being developed target that part of the, the immune system that causes destruction in the lungs. So if you look at it in terms of this graphic, inflammation caused by these neutrophils promotes infection. It causes you to make more mucus and it also causes damage to the lung and so causes the disease to get worse over time. 
So if we had an effective medicine that could reduce this inflammatory component, it could reduce the number of infections to reduce exacerbations. It might improve symptoms uh, by improving things like cough and mucus production, and it might prevent the progression of the disease. Um, and, uh, and some of the research that we've done over the years has suggested that that might be the case. But we needed an effective way to, to target that inflammation uh, and so brenzacatib is the first uh, type of medication that works on the neutrophil. And this is, uh, you can see my red pointer. This is a graphic of a neutrophil, one of these white blood cells. Uh, and this medication works on the white blood cell to prevent the activation of these proteins that the white blood cell fires into the lung. Um, and if you'll forgive the analogy, uh, the best analogy I use with my patients to explain this is your neutrophil is like the immune system's gun. It's designed to attack uh, invading bacteria or other things. And these proteins, these pro what we call proteases are like the bullets. And a gun is not, is not able to cause any damage if it doesn't have any bullets in it. And so what Brenzacatib does is that it, block, it blocks an enzyme called DPP-1 that inactivates these proteins and so the, the gun no longer has the bullets that can cause damage to the lung. Uh, and we, had, we already had data that this might be a good way to treat people with bronchiectasis because um, the, the pharmaceutical company that have been developing this, um, and I was part of this trial, um, uh, conducted a phase two trial, which is an earlier stage of development called the Willow trial, where they tested two doses of this medication, Brenzacatib, and both of the doses reduced exacerbations, which is probably the most important outcome um, that we see in people with bronchiectasis. And it also dampened down inflammation in the lungs. So the last stage of clinical development, the last stage of developing a medication before it can be used in patients uh, is called a phase three trial. Um, and that's the, the stage when you really find out whether something is effective and safe for patients. And so the ASPIN study was a phase three trial testing two doses of this oral medication called Brenzacatib. Uh, and the two doses are 10 milligrams and 25 milligrams. Uh, and it was tested against a placebo. So the patients didn't know what they were receiving and the, the people conducting the study, including myself, didn't know what patients were receiving. And patients took the medication for one year um, and the primary outcome was how many chest infections, how many exacerbations did people have? The other important outcomes were other types of uh, ways of measuring exacerbations, lung function measured by blowing into a spirometer, measuring symptoms using questionnaires, um, uh, and um, also using a daily diary. So all of these things were used to measure is, is reducing inflammation with this anti-inflammatory medication better than taking the placebo? Uh, and it, it, obviously not every patient with bronchiectasis can be enrolled into a trial like this. Patients were included if they had confirmed bronchiectasis on a CT, they had two or more chest infections, exacerbations in a year. Um, they were between 18 and 85 years old. The study also included a small number of adolescents, um, which is important because um, adolescents can also get bronchiectasis. Um, and patients also had to have symptoms. They had to be able to produce a sputum sample at the screening visit. Patients were excluded if they had certain types of bronchiectasis that require specific treatments like CF, ABPA, active NTM, uh, and also if their main disease was COPD or asthma. This is an amazing logistical achievement because it's the, by far the largest clinical trial ever conducted in people with bronchiectasis. Um, 1,680 adults and 41 adolescents, uh, an extraordinary achievement, a global trial, as you can see from the green colors on the slides, um, and a huge congratulations to um, everybody involved, but particularly to all of the patients who participated. Uh, and I'll come back to that that later, but really what a, what a fantastic effort by um, patients, so many patients to be willing to participate in, in, in this effort. So in the end, as I mentioned, um, 
the, the, the trial randomized 1,767 patients with bronchiectasis, uh, an almost equal number receiving the two doses of brendacatib as receiving the placebo. And the other details on this slide um, are there if, if anybody is interested, but are not, not critical. Um, so the same number, one to one to one, were randomized to the three groups. Um, and this is the this is the primary outcome. And we were so delighted. I was so uh, happy. I can't tell you how happy I was when I first saw these results um, showing for the first time that an anti-inflammatory medicine can reduce exacerbations in people with bronchiectasis. And I'll quickly walk you through this slide. Over the course of the one year that patients were followed up, um, the patients who were, who were taking the placebo tablet, which contained no active drug, had just under 1.3 on average exacerbation per year. And that was reduced by 19.4% in people who took Brendacatib 25 milligrams and 21.1% in people taking 10 milligrams. The so people who took the, the active medication had less exacerbations than people who took the placebo. It worked. Um, and it worked at a level that you could be confident from a statistical point of view that this was a true result. In terms of the time to the first exacerbation, this is following all of the patients up from their first visit until the time that they have their first chest infection that they report to the hospital uh, or to the, to the clinic. What you can see here is that the lines separate. So the gray line is the placebo line, and the, the two lines that you see that are blue in color and dark blue in color are the treatment groups. And by the end of the trial, they've separated because the patients who are taking the medication are having less exacerbations, less first exacerbations. And so this trial was also positive on that end point of the time to the first exacerbation. So what does that mean for a patient? Well, the next bit of data that we showed at the conference helps to put that into some sort of context. Um, if I could say to you that a medication would, uh, would increase the likelihood that you went through an entire year without having a, an, a, an exacerbation, would that be meaningful to you? I think it, it would for many patients. Um, and what you can see on the slide here is that the odds of going through an entire year without having a chest infection, without having an exacerbation, were about 40% higher for both doses of the medication. You'll see a consistency as I'm going through these endpoints that the two doses of the medication were giving the same level of effect on the, the endpoints for exacerbation. Um, so both of them were working. They were working at a really good level from a patient point of view, but there didn't seem to be any difference between them. That changes when we come to the next set of data that I'm going to show you. Um, and this is the lung function data. So the patients that are listening to this, this presentation, I'm sure many of you or perhaps most of you have blown into a spirometry machine either every few months or annually or, or every few years with your doctors to measure the level of your lung function. Um, and it's a measure for us as doctors of how uh, severe the disease is and the change over time tells us whether the disease is getting worse over time. Uh, and we know that people who've got bronchiectasis, their lung function gets worse slightly more quickly than the rest of the population, okay? So let me walk you through this slide so you understand the result. And I, I'll be honest with you, this is the slide that got me most excited about the Brenzacatib data. Um, because this data shows that the medication can slow down the progression of the disease or may be able to slow down the progression of the disease. So the lines here are the lung function, the, the, um, the number of milliliters that people are blowing out in the machine. And you can see that the placebo group in the gray has declined on down from the zero point, um, just over 60 milliliters less by the end of one year on average. The 10 milligram uh, arm of the treatment doesn't seem to be very different to the placebo. It's a little bit better, but it's not uh, dramatically better. But look at the 25 milligram. After the 16 weeks, after the first few weeks of the trial, this line becomes flat. Um, so the patients who are being given the 25 milligram dose of the medication are not progressing as rapidly as the people who are on placebo. In fact, the progression 
seems to be flattening. And overall, by the end of the study, the difference there is about 38 milliliters. And that's more than the, than the amount that we say on average, uh, the healthy a healthy person's lung function will decline over a year. So it's almost taking somebody with bronchiectasis and turning the level of their decline over a year into what we would expect from somebody who's not got bronchiectasis like myself. Um, so uh, another way of putting this is, what if I told you that there's a medication now that can stop the, the bronchiectasis from getting worse as quickly over time? That's really exciting. Severe exacerbations means exacerbations that are bad enough to end up with people being admitted to hospital or needing intravenous antibiotics. And the data that we presented at the conference showed that there was about a 25% reduction in the risk of being admitted to hospital with an exacerbation. Now, the number of these events was much lower. Uh, and so the statistical confidence uh, that this is a true result is less. So we say that this is not statistically significant. Um, we don't need to get into a detailed statistical discussion here, um, but it's it just to make you aware that that's the case. What this tells me is that 20, uh, we already know that the medication reduces exacerbations by about 20%. It's reducing severe exacerbations by about the same amount. So it means that if, you've, if you're somebody who's at risk of being admitted to hospital, this medication is also reducing the risk of those bad exacerbations from happening. So your next question would be, is this medication going to make me feel better? Um, and we would expect that it would because it's reducing inflammation in the lungs. Inflammation causes cough and mucus production. So we would hope that it would res uh, medication that can reduce inflammation would also reduce the uh, inflammation in the lungs. And, and here the graph is a little bit complicated, but let me walk you through it. These are the results of the questionnaires that patients are filling out at each of their visits. Uh, and the questionnaires, every few weeks, they are giving their scores of what their cough and their sputum and their breathlessness is like. And a higher score is an improvement. So you can see that the people in the placebo group feel a bit better. Being in a clinical trial often makes you feel better. Um, but the, the group, the patients taking the treatment are feeling even better than that because those lines are going higher. The level at which those lines are going higher, the, the group that are on the 25 milligram uh, dose of brenzocatib by the end of the study, feel about eight points better on the, the questionnaire. Uh, and that's a level where people will report that they feel, they notice the difference, they notice that they feel better. Uh, so the difference is, a, is just under four points between the 25 milligram dose and the, um, and the placebo group. So again, si significant effect, patients are feeling better. We presented a couple of extra bits of data at the conference that I will very quickly walk you through. The lung function measure I showed you before is FEV1. It's when you blow into the spirometry machine, it's the first second how much air comes out. This result is now the total volume of the lung, which is the FBC. Um, and what you can see here is a very similar result to the FEV1. The placebo group is getting worse. The 25 milligram brenzocative group is uh, almost flat, so almost not getting worse. It is getting slightly worse, but it's, it's almost flat. This again suggests that this medication can slow down the progression of the disease, and it's a really exciting result. And the other bit of data that we showed was that every patient who participated in the ASPIN trial completed a diary where they recorded their symptoms on a daily basis. Uh, and this is the results of that. And a lower score means that patients feel better. Uh, and you don't need me to tell you that the purple line here is lower than the other two lines. That means that the patients taking the 25 milligram dose of brenzocatib were reporting that they were feeling better on a day-to-day -day basis um, compared to the other groups. So it seems like the 25 milligram dose of the brenzocatib is helping more with the lung function and is helping more with the symptoms. And that's what these um, slides are showing. 
So really, really encouraging results around the efficacy of the medication. The other data that we showed at the conference was the safety data and the side effect profile also looked really good. So the, uh, we report adverse effects, which means potential side effects in clinical trials. Um, and in simple terms, what you can see on this slide is that, is that overall side effects more people were having side effects from the placebo group compared to the two treatment groups. Um, what that means is not, not that there aren't side effects with medications, of course there are, um, with any medication, um, but that actually the placebo patients are reporting as much as the other two groups, which means that for most patients, um, this, uh, the medication is not having any problems that they wouldn't also see just from having bronchiectasis and taking a placebo. Um, if we look at the only side effect that we saw that was more common in the brenzocatib group compared to the placebo group um, that we know is something that we might expect to see with a medication like brenzocatib um, is um, a side effect called hyperkeratosis. This is uh, where you get thickening of the skin or a little red rash. Um, this was not this was not a serious side effect. It was mild to moderate for most people. It didn't cause uh, most people to have to stop taking the drug, um, but it is a known side effect of this type of anti-inflammatory medication. What's really great is that there was no meaningful increase in infections because we always think if you if you do something with the immune system, there could be a risk of infections. We didn't see that in this trial. So the safety data, the side effect profile of this medication also looked really excellent. Um, and uh, that's really encouraging for patients. So this was a massive moment for research into bronchiectasis. The first detailed data, um, and these are the, the same slides that we showed at the conference. Um, the, um, the detailed data showed that this is a really exciting um, medication that could have a big role in the future management of people with bronchiectasis because uh, brenzocatib was able to reduce the number of exacerbations, prolong the time to the next exacerbation, and the 25 milligram dose also slowed down the progression of the disease as measured by lung function and made patients feel better. Um, and it was well tolerated uh, and appeared to have a really good safety profile. So I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about that data, but that was a, a really huge discussion point at the conference um, and uh, patients who were there were really interested in these results. Uh, Aspen was not the only trial of this type of medication that was presented. Very briefly, we presented the top line results of a medication in the same class, uh, which is called BI1291583. It doesn't have a, a, an easier to say drug name just yet. Um, and this was a phase two trial of this of a medication that does the same thing, affecting those neutrophil cells. Um, in previous studies, it was shown that increasing doses of this medication could result in increasing levels of an anti-inflammatory effect. And so the purpose of this trial was to see which of these doses would be the best, and if increasing the dose increased the efficacy of the medication. And so the trial was designed where patients were asked to take three different doses, five milligrams, 2.5 milligrams, or one milligram of this new medication against placebo. And as, a, as with the other trial that I mentioned, patients didn't know which of the medications they were taking, and physicians didn't know which medication they were taking. And patients could be treated for a minimum of six months and a maximum of one year. And the purpose was just to see as you increase the dose, do you see a, a, an increasing benefit on exacerbations? It, the inclusion criteria were very similar to the previous trial that I mentioned, the Aspen trial. So I won't spend much time on this slide, apart from they included patients who had one exacerbation, whereas the previous trial allowed only patients who had a history of two exacerbations. This is the number of patients included. It's a much smaller trial than the Aspen trial because it's the, the phase two, the earlier phase of development before we go for the big efficacy trial. Um, 109 patients got placebo, 107 got 
the five milligram dose of the new medication. And you can see the numbers who got 2.5 milligram and the one milligram there. This is the, the spread of the different kinds of patients that were included in the study. Most people had idiopathic or post-infective bronchiectasis. Uh, and they presented very brief top line results at the Congress, but the good news was that the trial was positive. So they said that the dose response was established. So as the dose of the medication increases, um, that suggests that there's an increasing benefit on exacerbations. Uh, and they reported an approximate effect size of 30% uh, for prolonging the time to first exacerbation. And they told us that the next um, results will be presented at another Congress in Europe in a few months time. They also reported that there was no major safety concerns with no increase in infections. Uh, and they also mentioned the, that side effect again of the thickening of skin, uh, what we call hyperkeratosis, which were mild to moderate, but increased with dose. So this suggests that another of these medications is on the way, but they, they're at the, the earlier stage. So they still need to go on and do a phase three trial. And they announced at the conference that the phase three trial will begin in early 2025. And just an interesting point was that they've also included patients with cystic fibrosis in another trial. Um, and they announced that they would be including cystic fibrosis patients uh, in, the, in the trial that's coming forward. So that hopefully broadening the group of patients that could benefit from anti-inflammatory medications um, in bronchiectasis. So very briefly, I'm gonna mention two more medications that were presented at the conference. These are uh, ARENA-1 and the inhaled antibiotics. Um, so ARENA-1 is an inhaled medication that's a combination of ascorbic acid and glutathione. Um, so this is meant to break up mucus and help mucus be easier to move. And in the laboratory, this graph is showing that this medication in increases uh, the movement of mucus along ciliated epithelium or uh, the, um, the airway. Um, and so it seems to thin mucus and make it easier to move and therefore to cough up uh, in the laboratory. But that needs to be proved in patients. Uh, and so the company designed a trial, which they presented at the conference, uh, and they randomized 29 people to nebulize this medication called ARENA-1 twice a day, and 11 patients to nebulize 0.9% saline, which was the placebo. Uh, and it's good to remember that 0.9% saline sometimes is used as a treatment for bronchiectasis, so it might not have no effect at all. But they were looking to see if this medication has more of an effect. Uh, and the main test here was whether this was safe uh, and tolerable for patients. So the primary outcome was tolerability and adverse effects, but they also measured quality of life and symptoms to see if there was uh, reason to believe that this was going to make people feel better. This is the characteristics of the patients, and I won't spend long on this, uh, on this um, chart, just to say that the average person with bronchiectasis is about 65 years. Um, and quite a lot of the patients had previously used hypertonic saline, uh, which is a, a medication that we use often for people with bronchiectasis. So as a reminder, 29 people in the ARENA-1 group, 11 in the placebo group, five people had to withdraw. Um, and that's so the final numbers in the ARENA-1 group were 24. Uh, and the primary outcome was safety. Um, and there did seem to be a few more side effects in the ARENA-1 group than the placebo group. You can see there 86% versus 45%. Um, and the main one was cough. Um, and there's a debate to be had, and maybe we can talk about this during the Q&A, for a medicine that's trying to help you cough stuff up, whether cough is a good thing or a bad thing. Sometimes stimulating cough is a good thing, um, but um, it was certainly reported more as an adverse effect in this study. 25% um, of patients felt more breathless on the medication. Uh, and so, so that's something also to keep in mind with this, this type of medication. We see similar things uh, with medications like hypertonic saline. But the important thing was that they got, they got a good signal suggesting that patients might be feel, feeling better with this medication. This is a, a questionnaire called the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire, a lower score is a good thing. And you can see that more people are feeling better with the treatment than in the placebo group. 
And that's also the case with a, a, a questionnaire called the COPD assessment test or chronic airway assessment test, uh, as it's now called. So it looks like this medication was making people feel better as well as stimulating more cough. So when they look at that in more, in more closely, remember a, a certain level of improvement is needed for patients to say, I feel much better on this. More people were saying that with the ARENA-1 treatment than with the placebo treatment. So this looks really encouraging. The trial is quite small, but it looks like more people are feeling better and that overall it's reasonably well tolerated via the nebulizer. Um, and so this is going to go again to um, larger trials in order to, it, to definitively establish how effective this is. So the last one I'm going to mention is an inhaled antibiotic called colistin or colomycin. Um, and this is the PROMISE trials. And this is two trials that were conducted at the same time where patients were giving a, given a nebulizer containing an antibiotic or a placebo for a year. And again, the patients and the doctors didn't know who was, who was taking what. Um, it was blinded. Again, it was a global trial conducted all over the world. Um, so lots of different types of patients were able to participate, but everybody in this study had pseudomonas infection because um, the medication that we're using here, colistin, the antibiotic, particularly targets pseudomonas. So you had to have two or more chest infections a year, confirmed pseudomonas, and lung function above 25%. Um, and this was a really interesting presentation because it shows you some of the challenges that we've been through over the last few years. There were two, two trials, PROMISE-1 and PROMISE-2. PROMISE-1 showed a 40% reduction in exacerbations, which is a fantastic result for patients. But un unfortunately, PROMISE-2 didn't show the same thing, even though the trials were exactly the same. When we look at um, severe exacerbations, there was an even bigger signal in PROMISE-1, but no signal in PROMISE-2. And when we look at symptoms, remember a lower score is better. The people who were taking the nebulizer with the antibiotic in it in PROMISE-1 felt better. The people who were taking the placebo did not, uh, didn't feel better. But in PROMISE-2, both of the groups felt better. So something was happening in PROMISE-2 that wasn't happening in PROMISE-1. Um, PROMISE-1 was a really positive trial, PROMISE-2 missed a lot of its endpoints. Um, and the presenter of this uh, paper took us through the reasons for that. And the big difference is that PROMISE-2 happened predominantly during the COVID-19 pandemic. And all of you who are on this call will know during 2021 and 2022, we were doing a lot of things differently. Uh, we were wearing masks, we were social distancing. And we know from this study that I performed with some people in my lab, the chest infections exacerbations went down during the COVID pandemic by about 50%. Um, and so the trial was probably conducted in a very different circumstance with PROMISE-2 than it was in PROMISE-1. And that might explain why we got different results. Um, as we say here, the, the experimental conditions were completely different. The number of exacerbations had gone down. Um, the collection of data was more difficult. Um, and patients were, like yourselves, were doing things very differently. So that might explain why the results were different, um, and, but it's uh, always difficult when you, when you have different results from trials that you would expect to give the same result. But sort of supporting the idea that COVID was the cause of the problem here, these are the results showing the percentage reduction in exacerbations from all of the data collected outside of the pandemic, including the PROMISE-2 study for the patients that were treated before the pandemic was declared. And this is the results uh, during the pandemic. And they're obviously completely different to the results that we see before the pandemic. If we just take the results before the pandemic and put them all together, you end up with about a 30 to 40% reduction in exacerbations. So this suggests that there is some efficacy for inhaled antibiotics. Um, and this is something that this medication is something that's widely used in Europe uh, and is recommended by our guidelines in Europe. And this was this would support those guideline recommendations that inhaled antibiotics may help people who've got pseudomonas. So those are all a series of really exciting results that are coming through. 
Um, I mentioned as a last point that we had some special tracks at the conference for specific types of bronchiectasis. We had a section on PCD, primary ciliary dyskinesia. We had one on NTM. I'll briefly show a couple of slides that pr were presented during those sessions. This one I want, you know, if you've got PCD, it's time to get excited because there is specific drugs now being developed that target the genetic mutation that caused PCD. Uh, and this was a slide that was shown at the conference of a trial that's now underway where patients are getting a medication that specifically corrects the genetic defect for people who have this specific genetic cause of PCD. Cystic fibrosis has been revolutionized by medications that target the specific gene defect. And I really hope we see the same in PCD. And then finally for NTM, um, the, uh, at the conference, uh, these slides were shown uh, on a recent trial comparing uh, two drugs, azithromycin and ethambutol for people with NTM, non-cavitary NTM lung disease, um, and uh, ALICE, which is um, liposomal amikacin. Uh, the combination of those three medications versus the two medications and uh, empty liposomes, which means, again, that's, that's the control. Um, uh, and this is looking now at the microbiology uh, over six months, over the first six months of the study, uh, and what it or the first seven months of the study, I should I should say, uh, and what it shows is that the addition of the nebulized antibiotic, which is amikacin, resulted in more people clearing the NTM and having what we call sputum culture conversion. That means the sputums go to negative in the group that received Alice compared to the group that just received the two oral drugs. Um, this is important because at the moment, um, certainly in Europe and in the United States, um, the nebulized antibiotic is only recommended in our guidelines for refractory disease. So we only use it when patients have failed on the, um, the initial drug regimens. Uh, and this is suggesting that there may be a benefit in terms of more people converting to sputum negativity uh, if this is used up front as part of a combination drug regime uh, in people who don't have refractory disease. Uh, and this is showing again that all the way through the study, um, the, con the conversion actually happened quite early on. Um, so that the addition of that medication seems to achieve quite early conversion to negativity for people with NTM. So we look forward to seeing more of this data um, along with all of the trials that I've shown you, all of these will be published in the scientific literature in due course, and I hope will lead us to uh, understanding more about um, how to treat these special types of, of bronchiexis or these subsets of bronchiexis like NTM. I'm going to finish with this slide, uh, and this was shown by one of the presenters from my group on the last day, um, and this is really showing you uh, the future for bronchiectasis is really very, very bright. Some of these medications are now uh, ready, to, hopefully, to come into clinical practice, like the DPP-1 inhibitors. But there are so many different targets now that we understand uh, in bronchiectasis in NTM and PCD because, we, because we've done the science, because we've started to understand the disease, that I believe we're going, going to see a, a whole new generation of treatments coming for people with bronchiectasis. And that means that you can look forward to less exacerbations, less symptoms, uh, slower decline in lung function over the next few years because uh, of better treatments that are on their way. So my summary of the World Bronchiexis Conference in Dundee is, um, as I said on, on, I think, the second day, we did it. We've got treatments for bronchiexis that work, um, and uh, that's fantastic news. Um, Brenzacatib has shown efficacy, um, and I hope it will become the first approved licensed treatment for people with bronchiectasis. I can stop uh, introducing every talk that I give on bronchiectasis by saying there are no licensed treatments. Uh, obviously, that depends on getting regulatory approval uh, in the United States and, uh, and around the world. Um, we have new treatments for inflammation. We also have new things in development for mucociliary clearance and for infection. We have more trials than ever before. And I, I believe that the future is really bright and that the World Bronchiexis Conference in Dundee was a, uh, a critical moment in terms of kicking off 
uh, a revolution in, in better treatments for people with bronchiectasis and associated conditions. Um, and I said I would return to this. Um, I think this is the most important thing that I can say is I've just shown you a whole series of clinical trials. Um, and the only reason we were able to do those clinical trials and the only reason we now have breakthroughs in bronchiectasis uh, is because of you, the patients who've given up your time to participate in research, uh, to support clinical trials, in some cases to take medication for a year or more than a year, um, to give up so much of your, uh, your time and put so much effort into research for your fellow patients. Um, you are heroes um, and people for you know, next generations to come uh, will be better and will have better outcomes because of the contribution that you've made. Um, and so I want to say a massive thank you to you, the patient community, for everything that you've, that you've done. Um, so that's, that's uh, all I had to say uh, on the World Bronchiexis Conference, and I'm delighted to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Chalmers. Um, okay, so we have a bunch of questions already popping up, so I'll um, kick it off with the first one. Um, are there any negative side effects of brentacatib? Can you discuss some of the side effect profiles of the drug? Yeah, so the, the medication uh, on the safety data that I showed you, it looks looks very safe um, in, in simple terms in that there were no major increases in adverse effects compared to people who were taking the placebo. Now, the one I did mention, though, is this hyperkeratosis, which is thickening of the skin. Um, so in some people, that's sort of, you know, a, a blotch on the hand or the feet. It can be a blotch on another part of the body. That does seem to happen. The numbers were really small. You know, I showed you, I think, 17 cases in more than 500 people that took the 25 milligram dose. So it's not something that's going to happen very often, but it is a recognized side effect of this class of medication that's something we'll have to watch out for. The good news is that uh, people didn't generally have to stop taking the medication um, because it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uncomfortable, it wasn't a big problem, um, but it, it's definitely something that's, that's gonna be on, on there as a, something that we tell patients about as a side effect. Um, okay, next question. Will Brentacatib um, help all patients with bronchiectasis or only certain patients whose disease specific, uh, fits a specific profile or phenotype? And if so, what would that phenotype be? So that's a great question. So um, at the moment, the only way we can really answer that question is to look at the type of patients that were enrolled in the study. So that was a broad spectrum of people with bronchiectasis. So the, the trial enrolled people with idiopathic post-infective bronchiectasis PCD, some inflammatory diseases, and a history of two exacerbations. So the medication's likely to benefit a broad spectrum of people with bronchiectasis who are experiencing frequent exacerbations. But it did exclude people who had, for example, active NTM, or whose main condition was asthma, or um, some other conditions like active ABPA. So there are some groups of patients where they weren't in the trial, so we don't have data, so we, at the moment, we wouldn't be able to say confidently that it would benefit them. Okay. Um, we have a question from one of the, uh, somebody who was the, I think they might've been, yeah, they were a trial participant. Um, and they're asking, when will Aspen trial participants be told which group they were in? Um, they wanted to know, because they want to know if they were in the placebo group um, or the, 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 the drug group. Yeah, I don't have an exact answer to that question. That would be a question we'd have to refer to the company. Um, but I think that will happen quite soon because the, the trial has closed and, and all of the trial closeout processes are, are in process at the moment. So I would hope it would be soon, but, but it, that really would be a, a, a question for the company. Um, uh, yeah, Mary, do, do you... Do you have any information? I feel like they they had mentioned some, they might have mentioned something in one of their calls, in one of their press releases. Um, I I do not recall if they did. Oh, yeah. I um, it I don't think it's expected to be available this year. It's um, not going to be this year, but I don't think we're yeah. going to be waiting years and years. <laughs> no, no, um, I I I think it's ex you know, when when you say expected, it's going to the FDA. So, right. um, you know, but I, I think 
maybe in the second half of next year. Um, are, you, but, are, you, are you are you talking about when it's going to be available? Um, when when it would go through regulatory approval, yeah. 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 So they they did mention that in one of their their calls. So they said in in 2025, the hope would be to launch in the U.S. and that in other areas like Europe, it might be 2026. Okay. But it all it all depends on the the discussions with the regulators and and all yeah. of that going. On. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, well, that was a, um, a que another question. Um, so let me see how far we how far away are we from getting Brentacat approved for all, all patients? Um, here's a good question. Does this rule out people with COPD? They are also being treated for NTM and they have CO they've had COPD exacerbations this year, which I think is a great question about this. Yeah, that's a really, really tricky question. So um it's one of these things that um, we're going to have when this medication is available, and I hope it's soon, um, because I have a lot of patients I think would benefit. Um, the, um, the trial excluded people who had a primary diagnosis of COPD, but it included people who had a main diagnosis of bronchiexis, but who also had COPD. Um, and so it will come down, I think, um, assuming uh, the our use of the medication follows what we did in the trial, which it usually does with new medications. Um, it will come down to your doctor's judgment on whether it, the main problem is bronchiectasis or the main problem is COPD. Because if the main problem is bronchiectasis, you would have been eligible for the ASPEN trial, which means that the, the benefit applies to you, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, that, that does make sense. If the problem is in fact bronchiectasis. Um, we have uh, somebody who's asking two questions. The first was about availability, which we answered. Um, but the next question um, they're asking, is it a pill or inhaled? So what what is the format of the drug? Yeah, it's a once daily pill, okay. uh, which is obviously great news because, um, you know, um, one of the other problems we have in bronchiectasis is treatment burden with nebulizers and, and other types of treatments. So this is an easy one to take. Um, here's a great question. Will these new classes of medication like Brensicatab allow the bronchiectasis community to stop taking some of their medications or their airway clearance therapies? Ah, great question. So on airway clearance, I don't think so. Um, so airway, so although this is having a really major effect and I'm delighted with the results, um, it's not completely eliminating symptoms or um you're having those sorts of effects that mean that I think that patients would, would want to stop doing airway clearance. Airway clearance is absolutely critical part of treatment of bronchiectasis. And the way I think about it is, um, if you remember that circle that I, I drew, drew with, you know, infection, inflammation, and, and mucociliary clearance, the best treatment's probably to, to take care of all three of those components. So it would be to the best effect will probably be to take brenzacatib, but also to do your airway clearance. And if infection's a problem, to also take care of the infection. So I, I don't think we're going to be withdrawing uh, many treatments. Okay. Um, so here's a question that's following. For those of us with NTM or MAC, would brenzacatib be recommended with NTM treatment, or is that not known? So unfortunately, that's not known because um, patients with NTM on treatment were not uh, a group that was included in the trial. Um, so there was a bit of debate at the conference about the role of these neutrophils in NTM and whether tackling inflammation could help in future with NTM treatment. We don't know. Um, it's a really good question, but it would require specific trials. Um, we have a couple of questions um, related to prednisone. Um, so um, the first one is until Brensicatib is available, what is your opinion of low dose, say my, five milligrams of prednisone for lowering inflammation in the lungs? And then somebody else is asking why isn't prednisone used for an inflammation treatment for bronchiectasis? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, uh, this allows me to discuss a little bit of my you know, biology and the research. So pred prednisone is, is thought of as an anti-inflammatory, but it actually affects different parts of the immune system than brenzacatib, okay? So prednisone will reduce some types of immune cells, but unfortunately for bronchiectasis, they're the wrong types of immune cells. 
So prednisone, if anything, can sometimes increase the risk of infections. Um, and it, it, does, it has an effect on the neutrophils that is not a beneficial effect. Uh, and the inflammation in bronchiexis is mostly driven by neutrophils. So unfortunately, prednisone is not a replacement for brenzocatib. Brenzocatib is special because it's the first type of medication that can target these specific white blood cells called neutrophils that affect people with bronchiectasis. So I don't recommend prednisone to any of my patients with bronchiectasis unless they've got coexisting asthma or ADPA or other types of inflammation that are, uh, that are responsive to steroid. Okay. Okay, um, so Dr. Chalmers, along that line, um, I don't see the question in the chat, but somebody had um, asked the question to me this week about the uh, three times a week is a thromycin. And there's obviously the NTM concerns um, with, with that treatment. And that treatment is meant to be, you know, for, for anti-inflammatory purposes. So um, do you anticipate and, or, you know, do, do you even know yet whether um, Brenzacatib could replace um, that three day a week um, treatment? Yeah, that's a really good question. And we've been thinking about that since we got these fantastic results. So the, the Aspen trial actually included people who were taking the three times a week azithromycin. Um, and so we will get some data shortly on the additive benefit of adding Brenzacatib on top of the the three times a week treatment, because it may be that the combination of the two is a really good way of tackling inflammation. As you pointed out, Mary, there's lots of reasons why you wouldn't want to use the three times a week azithromycin if you didn't have to. So it, it has certain side effects. It's an antibiotic, and so it can cause antibiotic resistance. And um, there's the risk of inducing, particularly in, inducing resistance in mycobacterium, in NTM. Uh, and so many doctors in the United States will not prescribe the three times a week to uh, people with bronchiexis because they're worried about NTM. So in those circumstances, Brenzacatib now provides a really good alternative anti-inflammatory that doesn't have those problems because it's not going to cause any issue with the NTM. Um, it's not going to cause antibiotic resistance because it's not an antibiotic. Um, so that that's, I think, really exciting. Yes, um, de yeah, definitely. Um, so I just want to be mindful of time. We are at um, five minutes past two East, East Coast time. Um, how, how are you go about going for maybe 10 more minutes? I, I will go for as long as you want to, Mary. No problem. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, so, it's a man that I'm convinced never sleeps. Yeah, well, it's 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 seven o'clock. It's seven o'clock in the UK, so plenty of time, no problem. Okay, all right, thank you, um, um, Mary. Yeah, we ahead, have Amy. a bunch of questions pertaining to um, bronchiectasis and different conditions like asthma um, or having bronchiectasis and NTM, and asking like, you know, would it be approved? And asking, you know, about the the neutrophil. So, Dr. Chalmers, let me ask you this: If somebody has NTM and they're being treated for it, and they have bronchiectasis, you know, would would there be an indication to treat? And if they have something else like asthma, how would they make the determination to treat with Brensicata? Would they be looking for this neutrophilic action? Yeah, that's a really tricky question. So um, I'm not sure what how how that's going to sort of play out, Amy, because as I said, the, the NTM treated group were not included in the trials. Um, and so um, it may, they may not be a group where sort of the initial guideline recommendations suggest to use it. So there may be a, a recommendation to use other types of treatments for people who've got um, active NTM. Um, but uh, sometimes medications are used off label. Sometimes we you know, have to make difficult decisions because patients aren't doing, uh, doing well. So there may be circumstances where a patient with NTM, you might try a medication like this, but it's it's sort of difficult to um, sort of difficult to imagine at the moment. With the asthma, with the asthma question is easier because 
Um, we know from the trial, we included patients who had coexisting asthma as long as they also had bronchiectasis and the medication worked in the, in the aspen trial. So if a person has asthma and bronchiectasis um, and they're having bronchiectasis exacerbations, bronchiectasis is the, is the main problem, um, I would have no hesitation in suggesting that they could use brenzacatib. Um, okay, um, I wanted to address um, a couple of quick questions that I think we can um, answer before moving on. Is there any advocacy or action we can do as patients to expedite the approval of brenzacatib or other successful trial medications? Is requesting it from our doctor helpful? So if it is not an approved drug, requesting it from your doctor will not help because they can't get it if it's not approved. Once it's approved, yes, they can. Um, as terms of advocacy or action, um, you know, the first thing that has to happen after the clinical trial is completed and, and the data are analyzed, the company uh, has to file what's called an NDA, a new drug application. They have to file for an approval uh, with the FDA. Once that happens, then we see how it shakes out from there. You, the, the agency, the, the FDA then has the option to give that approval or to have what's called an advisory committee meeting where an actual advisory committee that they have, it's a standing committee, you know, looks at all the data, presents it, and has like a full day of discussion. Sometimes they have an ad comm, sometimes they don't. We don't know what will be the case here. We know that, you know, with um, with uh, Alice, with Eric Case, there was an ad comm. It was a very long day. Um, there was patient involvement. Um, both before, during, and after, we there were several patients who spoke at that adcom. There were patients who wrote afterwards to the FDA explaining why the drug approval was so important. Whether that happens or not, we don't know yet. But when we see what's shaking out, you you better believe we will be communicating with all of you to let you know about that. Um, so the other question I wanted to address was somebody was asking about a trial of amatocycline. Um, so omatocycline is not a similar drug. It's an antibiotic. It's not a, it's a, it's not a drug that's in the same class as brentacatib. Um, so it's a completely different kind of drug. Um, there is a, a clinical trial, um, that just completed enrollment for omatocycline. Um, it was, it's a clinical trial for obsessus and we are hopeful that we will soon have a, an approved treatment for obsessus as well. All right, Mary, you want to take a question? Uh, Amy, why don't you go ahead? I'm replying to, to somebody's question. <laughs> <laughs> it's great um, to see so many questions. This is obviously- yes, Well, some of these questions are, are things that, that we can... Um, um, so, okay, here uh, here is... Okay, let me see. Um, did the included treatment arms have similar severity of bronchiectasis um, or number of affected lobes? So in other words... Um, were the different treatment arms kind of apples to apples include in terms of the severity of bronchiectasis? Absolutely. And, and just be, because of time, I didn't have uh, time to sort of explain that in more detail, but the, the patients were randomized to each of the groups like flipping a coin. And so the result of that, because it's completely random, is that you end up with three groups that look almost exactly the same. So when we look at the age, the sex, the number of chest infections, the FEV1, the, uh, the symptoms, all of these things, the three groups look almost exactly the same, um, okay. meaning, that, meaning that we can be really confident that those results are due to the medication. Great, yes, thank you. Uh, question, will Brensicatib help bronchiectasis patients even if they are not facing frequent exacerbations, but they have heavy mucus production and a recurring cough? That's a really great question. So the that when I presented the data, there were a lot of questions afterwards. And a lot of the questions from physicians were around the lung function and the symptom data saying, you know, the trials are all about exacerbations, but what if I've got a patient whose lung function is getting worse really rapidly or has really bad symptoms? You know, would I consider the medication in those patients? Obviously, we need to wait and see the approval process and um, what, the, what we're allowed to do in terms of prescribing the medication. But the, the data I've shown you is very clear. The treatment will make you feel better and the treatment will slow down the progression of the disease um, on average, more so than the placebo group. Um, so that would suggest that, yeah, if you've got a lot of symptoms and you, or your lung function is getting worse rapidly, this could be something that would be beneficial. 
Okay, somebody's asking, what are the recent approved anti-inflammatory medications for children with non-CF bronchiectasis? I, I don't know of any, but... I'm sorry to say there are no approved treatments for children with bronchiectasis. Um, what's really great about the ASPIN trial is that there was a small subgroup of adolescents, so uh, people over the age of 12, included in the trial. Um, and I hope that means that the medication may be able to be made available to younger people, um, because historically all the treatments get approved for adults and um, and children get a get a tough deal. Um, so I'm hoping that Brenzacative will be available also for at least older children. Do we know of any coming trials that are you know focused on children or including children, or is it? Uh, I'm afraid I'm not aware of any. Um, okay. Even so, PCD is often considered to be a pediatric disease, but even the pediat even the the PCD trial I mentioned is including adults initially. Okay, um, so here's a, a question. It's not directly related to Brent Sakata, but since we are talking about takeaways from uh, the World Bronchiectasis Conference, I think it's appropriate. Um, this uh, this poster says, thank you for the summary of new trials. We share your enthusiasm for the future. We do. Besides the new trials, were there any takeaways for patients um, or the attendees, the clinical attendees in the areas of airway clearance or environmental exposure, et cetera? Um, absolutely. So there was there was a, a whole um, afternoon of the conference dedicated to airway clearance, and then there was a, a physiotherapy track on the Saturday. Um, and what I think came through really well in that um, was um, there's more and more evidence for some of the techniques that we use, um, and techniques are becoming more sophisticated, including with the um, wider use of things like oscillatory PEP devices. If you've never heard of these before. These are devices that you blow into and they generate a bit of pressure in the airways and also vibrate to try and break up the mucus. So there's a lot of discussion of those and data on that being presented at the conference. Um, and more data showing that, that airway clearance is, is efficacious so that people who do airway clearance have fewer exacerbations and better control of their symptoms. There wasn't so much on environmental exposures um, that's maybe something that's that's missing from the content of the conference, and maybe that will be talked about a bit more in Australia next year. Um, yeah, I mean, it's I, I know that's a an area that uh, we actually are starting to focus on more because we need to have some consensus on the data as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Amy, I, I I would just like to interject um, that we we did NTM IR and. Um, the COPD Foundation and Running on Air hosted a airway clearance webinar in June. Um, Dr. McShane um, gave a, a very great talk on airway clearance. So maybe when we send out the link for um, the recording for this webinar, we can uh, yes, send we out will. that one also. That's a great idea. We will be sure to include that one as well. So um, I think that's a terrific idea. Um, there are other trials that are coming up in this space, Dr. Chalmers. Um, somebody's asking about uh, their Beringer Ingelheim um, is working on a drug. Do you know when they're, do you have any idea when they might be announcing, you know, that they're in opening the tr trial centers for enrollment? Yeah, so uh, we announced at the conference that that phase three trial is going to start at the beginning of 2025, so really soon. Um, so I would guess that the I, I would guess that the trial, all of the, the documents and the setup will be done at the end of this year, aiming to enroll the first patients at the beginning of next year. Um, so um, look out because um, that's another potential opportunity to um, to get involved in research. Great. Um, somebody is actually asking about um, the access to the conference. It was, they say it, it was extremely beneficial last year as a patient to have been able to attend the sixth annual conference virtually. They were able to bring back the information to their pulmonologists and better advocate for themselves. Is there a recording of sessions of information such as from the afternoon airway clearance talk and other findings that they would be able to access from the Dundee conference? Um, so I'm glad somebody brought that up because um, it's something that I've had a couple of questions about as well. Um, so we would have loved to have had patients um, able to access the conference and able to access the recordings. Unfortunately, it wasn't our choice. Um, it's a law in Europe, so it's a law made by the by the EU, 
Um, they regulate FPA and um, the, the, the regulations around um, healthcare and the pharmaceutical industry, which means that for medical conferences like this, members of the general public, including patients, are not able to participate as normal participants and view all of the, the, the conference materials. Um, it's not, not my choice. It's a law that applies to every type of conference, whether that's bronchiexis or uh, outside of the respiratory field. And I know it's different in the US, and so patients were able to, to directly access the conference that was in New York last year. Um, so what we've done is we've generated the summaries of the, the conference, um, which were the, the patient village sessions, which will be made available online um, to everybody. Uh, and they're summaries of a lot of the things that I've mentioned. Um, we did a, a, a session before the conference uh, on World Bronchiexis Day, and obviously we're doing the webinar this evening. So that's us, our attempt to, to cover the content of the the conference to try and get around something that we unfortunately have no control over, which is the, the European law. Okay, um, that's good to know. So when those summaries are available, we will make sure that we put that information out as well. Um, was there, um, oh, here's a question. Um, somebody, I guess they were asking about, I guess they're asking about the Aspen trial. Um, why, was, why were no patients from Africa included in the trial? Uh, good, great question. Um, I think it probably comes down to availability of trial sites and yeah. Yeah, um, sort of awareness and, and facility of the for management of the disease in certain parts of the world. So at the moment, we have almost no published data about bronchiexis in Africa. Um, and we've actually been working closely with colleagues in South Africa and Kenya and others in order to try and uh, help them to set up a network or bronchiexis in Africa. Um, and so I hope we'll be able to see some data coming out of Africa on bronchiexis in, in the future. Um, but it's it's not been an area that's been involved really in any previous clinical trials in bronchiexis um, because of the uh, the disease isn't sort of at a, at, a, at a stage of development that people are participating in clinical trials at the moment. It's something that, that needs to be addressed. Um, somebody was, is asking a question about the arena one clinical trial. Um, do you know any more about that clinical trial? Um, do you mean in terms of, um, it has it, the, the yeah, arena, I don't know if it's, if it has, has it finished enrolling or has it started enrolling? Yeah. So the, the phase two trial, which was the one that I showed you is completed. So that okay. shows positive benefits. I don't have any insider information, but based on that data, I would imagine that the company will be moving forward to a, a larger trial, a phase three trial, um, because those results look really encouraging. I'd be amazed if they weren't moving forward. Um, so hopefully in the next year or two, we'll see a, another trial, a, phase, a larger phase three trial, um, which I would guess would be a longer trial over maybe six months or a year to look at things like exacerbations. Um, somebody's asking, was there any, were there any information presented at, at WBC about um, nebulizing saline and maybe the different levels like 3% versus 7%? Was there anything about that at the conference? There wasn't, unfortunately. Um, so that it was discussed as something that we do, but there was no data presented on that. Um, but I have some good news on that, which is that um, in the UK, We've been conducting a trial of nebulized hypertonic saline against uh, control. Um, it's called the CLEAR trial. And we're hoping to announce the results of that trial at the end of this year. Um, and there's never been a controlled trial like that for nebulized saline before. Um, and it's several hundred patients. So um, I'll watch this space. Hopefully, I'll be able to show you at our next Running On Air webinar some more data on that. Uh, uh, hypertonic saline. That's good news. And there is also a trial um, on inhaled hypertonic saline being conducted by Kevin Winthrop's group out in Oregon. So now we have two trials going on, which is very good okay. news. Um, regarding the environment, was there anything presented at the conference regarding how different climates um, can affect bronchiectasis or exacerbations, maybe where you live or, you know, dry versus wet, hot versus cold? 
Yeah, really interesting. So there was on the first day we had a talk from Sanjay Chotamal from um, Singapore who presented a little bit of data on this, um, showing that the microbiome, so the bacteria that live in the lungs, and you'll all know how important infection is in bronchiectasis, that that was very different depending on where you lived uh, and that that could be related to things like climate. Um, but also he, he does some really interesting research showing that um, the bacteria in your home, you know, the air in your home can make a difference to the lung microbiome. So there's no question that the environment makes a difference um, and that things like temperature and humidity can make a difference to your risk of picking up certain types of infection. Um, and we, we kind of know that, don't we, Amy? Because, um, you know, we have more NTM in Hawaii than we do in other parts of the United States. That's almost certainly to do with climate. Florida. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, Florida. So, um, so what, what Sanjay is showing, what, what Professor Chotamal is showing is that that's not just unique to NTM. That's also the case with Pseudomonas. Um, that's also the case with other bacteria that vary depending on where you live. Yeah. And, and I would also say that um, we also know this because we know patients and this is it's anecdotal versus evidence. But we for years, we've had patients saying, you know, how I feel can depend on what the weather is like. Um, yeah. And we've heard patients say that. So, yeah, we we know that that's the case, but it's good that there's actual data now. There's, um, there's really clear data. I've I've also yeah. had Amy patients tell me that they felt really bad and then they moved house and their chest got much, much better. Yeah. So you, I think those those sorts of things, you're just changing your environment can sometimes mean a change in your in your lung condition. Uh, and now we have some science to explain some of that anecdotal evidence. OK, um, I think we're going to take this one last question and then we're going to wrap it up. Will there be more precise definitions of the treatment groups regarding, I guess they, they're saying genotypes. I don't know if it's genotypes or phenotypes for bronchiectasis, but are we going to get more specific definitions about, you know, di different gene, different phenotypes of bronchiectasis, for example, because we know that those exist? Um, is that going to be evolving? Yeah, I I really hope so. So I I think bronchiectasis is a really complex condition, uh, and as we as we learn more about it, we're getting uh, tests and and things that we can use in clinical practice that can subtype patients better and find the right treatment for the right patient. We call that personalized or precision medicine. And there were some good examples of that shown at the conference. So for example, you know, I've talked about brenzacatib and the neutrophils, you know, that's a, that's a precision treatment. It just, uh, it's something that works for a lot of people, but we saw data at the conference about the eosinophil. So some people have a certain blood test that's high and they seem to respond better to steroids or to asthma type treatments. Um, we've seen treatments that work differently depending on the microbiology in your lungs. Uh, and so I think over the next few years, you'll start to hear more about these phenotypes, these different subtypes of bronchiectasis and treatments will become much more targeted. Um, and the most extreme example of that is the, the PCD work that I mentioned to you, where you can literally take one gene and say, I've got a treatment that will only work against this one gene, but it'll make a huge difference for people who have that one gene. That's really exciting if we can start to really tailor the treatment to the individual patient. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chalmers. Um, we're, so there, there are a handful of questions. Um, we will... Um, we're going to discuss like what's the best way to respond. Uh, unfortunately, questions about diagnosing specific situations can't be answered in a webinar like this. So, um, but you know, we we will look at the remaining questions and um, get, send a response to to people. Um, again, I just want to remind everybody we did record the webinar. Uh, hopefully, it'll be up in the next week, maybe two. And uh, Running On Air will send out an email link uh, once the webinar to all everyone who's registered. Uh, once the webinar is available, we'll also include the airway clearance webinar. Um, and a couple people had asked about participating in trials. So in the United States, 
you can go to www.clinicaltrials.gov. And when we send out the email, we'll include that link too. And they have a list of all the trials based on disease groups. So you can search on bronchiectasis and see what trials are going on and if there's anything in your area. Um, you know, as, as Professor Chalmers said, if you don't, you know, if, if we as patients don't participate, we're not going to have treatments available. I mean, he, he didn't put it that way. I'm putting it that way. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> we, we all, we all want treatments. We all want a cure. Um, and the only way it's going to happen is through our participation. So I do want to thank too, there were a few people in the question and answer who said that they had participated in, in various locations um, throughout the, the world. So thank you guys for, for doing that uh, to make this possible for, 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 for all of us. And even for those who tried to enter the, the, who wanted to be part of it, but maybe didn't qualify, you know, cause that, that can be kind of disappointing when you want to participate and you don't meet the, the qualifications uh, for the trial. But you know your 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 willingness um, to 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 do that is also very much appreciated. So thank you, um, Amy, for 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 helping to moderate, and uh, thank you, Dr. Chom uh, Professor Chalmers, as always, um, for a great session. Uh, thank you to everybody for for uh, staying late and for all the questions and all your enthusiasm. I really appreciate it. And if there's any questions that are left over that you think that I can help answering. Um, just, just drop me an email, Mary. You know, I'm always happy to help. Yep. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everybody.